welcome to uh, another Cross Talk. Thank you for joining us on this uh, Wednesday evening. Uh, last couple of weeks, we've been talking about our involvement in the world uh, through our mission partnerships. It was great to have conversations with uh, Merle Menon and to be reminded of our brothers and sisters in India. And then uh, last week, a conversation with Frank and Anna Lee and uh, again, the connection that we have with the church in China and Chinese Christians all around the world. And it's wonderful to be part of this international body of Christ. Uh, but tonight we are uh, have Nathaniel Putnam with us and Nathaniel, welcome back to Crosstalk. Um, and we're gonna shift the focus back to our own nation and uh, do some reflection about America and our Christian faith here. Um, we're coming up soon, not this weekend, uh, but next weekend on Memorial Day. And on Memorial Day, of course, we remember uh, the men and women who have given their lives for our freedom, for our nation. And we also reflect on the meaning of our, our nation and the freedoms that we enjoy here. Uh, we have an incredibly rich uh, heritage and an incredible opportunity in our nation to, uh, to live, to enjoy life, but also to exercise our Christian faith. So Nathaniel, again, thanks for being with us. And uh, you've been doing a little bit of reflection on uh, sort of the roots of uh, America, our foundation documents. So tell us a little bit about uh, what you're thinking. Sure. Well, and, and it's a, a particular fascination with our government. We are Americans and, um, you know, historically the United States was a great experiment, uh, a noble experiment, and it continues to play out. and. Um, for all of the hard things that we experience now, people fighting for rights and everything, that's part of that experiment. Yeah. What does it mean to be a, a, a place where people do have, in theory, equal voice or equal representation in the law, where people have a say in the laws that are made? It's an incredible idea. Certainly in human history, it's a fantastic idea. It, it really is. And as you say, when you say experiment, it's not just like, oh, we're going to do an experiment, but it is really this, this is working out of these basic principles that are, are, are really uh, unique and wonderful. So tell us right. a little bit more. Right. Well, there's that. And then also, you know, going down this road, I'm interested in our government and I'm also interested in governments in, in general. Um, and we're, in this season where politics and government is certainly in the news, whether it be the debt ceiling or whether it be what's going on with our current president or our former president, everybody's in the news lately. So I think it's good not just to know the headlines, but to know what's going on underneath. What is government all about beyond the, the stupidity of the media? And then we're also in Eastertide, and we're also exploring this idea of what is Easter all about? And one of the realizations that has continued to sink in deeper and deeper and deeper for me over the past 10 or 15 years um, is that a large part of what God is up to is establishing a government. And I think that's a really helpful language for us to understand what is Easter about and what is God doing? So to understand governments, to understand the way they work, to understand uh, how we relate to them, I think it's in general just a fantastic thing. Yeah, the, the idea of government, I mean, it, it, on the surface of it, it seems like, well, okay, you know, we, we think about governments and different kinds of governments and um, that kind of thing. But I think in our, our hyper-individualistic culture today, uh, it's almost an an anarchy where people don't really assume that there is any authority beyond self. And so there's surprisingly, I don't think a lot of reflection in our knee jerk reflection is not to think about orderly government, but it's to think about me. So, you know, these ideas of government are just well, really important to, to get, start thinking about you get again. The insanity of, you know, a, a group of people who on the one hand uh, would like to shoot you if you don't, support the flag or stand up for the national anthem and on the other hand also want to blow up government buildings it's it's a bizarre allegiance to an idea and then an absolute hatred of the government i don't understand how they can be well, side by side but we certainly see that yeah but i think it is this is sort of general anarchy yeah. and so very important to return to 
foundational documents, foundational ideas about human order mm -hmm. and about divine order as well. Absolutely. So one of my favorite documents around just to read for its thoughts it's a incredibly well thought out document. It's a well written document. It's a little bit old language, but um, I think it's a wonderful piece of writing to interact with. Is our Declaration of Independence? Yeah. yeah. So, um, I, do you mind if I read a little bit from it? Yeah, please do. I mean, it's it's so important, and as you say, such a wonderful document. Yeah, I mean, we're used to you know the Boston Tea Party, you know, kind of don't tread on me stuff, but. There's a lot of thought that went into it, and, and many of the leaders of our nation at that time did not enter into the rebellion against Britain lightly. Um, and that's what the Declaration of Independence is about. It begins, when in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another, and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and nature's God entitle them. A decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. In other words, we're doing something that drastic. It's imperative that we explain to people why we're doing this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then he goes on to explain some basic ideas. Um, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, and that governments are instituted among men to secure these rights, and they derive their just powers from the consent of the governed. So um, governments exist to protect people and to protect people's basic rights. And governments also exist because the people who uh, are under the authority of the government assent to their rule. Whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, then it's the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute a new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. And then it goes on to make this observation that this is no small thing. Prudence will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light or transient causes. And accordingly, all experiences have shown that people are more disposed to suffer while the evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. But when things get bad enough, when a long train of abuses and usurpations happen, then it is their right, their duty to throw off such a government and provide new guards for their future security. And then they go on to enumerate, these are the abuses that we feel like we have suffered from the British crown. This is the reason that we are declaring our independence. But there's some pretty important foundational ideas in there. And to me, one of the most important is this idea of um, what we call social contract. The governments exist to protect the well-being of people, and when governments stop doing that, when governments become abusive, then people um, can choose to uh, rebel. It's an interesting idea. Yeah, and so in Thomas Jefferson, um, is not doing this lightly, but Jefferson knows of this conversation that's going on in Europe and Britain and the United States where a lot of people have been talking, John Locke and uh, <clears throat> Jean-Jacques Rousseau and, and a lot of other people have been discussing these ideas of social contract, of, of just government. And, and a lot of it has to do, as you say, with a keen observation. Uh, in a sense, these were social scientists that um, Jefferson was interacting with and just simply looking at, you know, what works for a society, what doesn't work. And I think the observation is that when people are oppressed, it, 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 you know, that, that can happen, but it's not going to last forever. 
it's, it's something that the natural law is involved with. And, and so there's got to be a change. And so there's a lot of thought and a lot of discussion and the social contract is a huge right. part of it. And it's important, again, to understand that this is an international conversation. 10 years after the American Revolution, the French will try and do the same thing mm -hmm. based on similar principles. Outcomes are very different. But uh, it is an international conversation yeah. that's being had. Yeah, yeah. So, okay, we've got the social contract and um, America is being built on, on this idea that we need to bring people together for the common good and so forth. Any other observations in American history about the working out of this? Uh, well, I, you know, I think th there's always a struggle and a tension. And in American government, we do have this idea of representative democracy and that in some way, even though it doesn't always feel like our votes are worth very much, but in some way, we, we are, do have some say in our government and our governments and the laws um, that are made and the enforcement of those laws. Um, and it requires an enormous amount of good faith and trust mm. because what's good for me may not be good for my neighbor and what's good for my neighbor may not be good for me. And, uh, and I think... It is imperative if this form of government is going to continue to work. It's it's so important for us to be able to step out of ourselves and just think about what life might be like for somebody else for a little bit. Uh, the the knee jerk reaction is always, I'm angry, I'm not happy, somebody's going to pay. Um, and again, you know, as Jefferson says, you know, at some point abuses pile up, but but. Um, I think it is hasty and rash to say because I am mildly uncomfortable in the present that somebody's head is going to roll. That actually was the French Revolution, and it really didn't work. Yeah. Um, but to be able to take a step back and say, okay, I can weigh what I want with what somebody else wants. We can try to meet in the middle. Um, if the government is going to continue to work, that's the only way. And again, the alternative I don't think is any better. Yeah. The alternative is... Anarchy, which is what the French Revolution devolved into, um, every nincompoop with a with a gun or, or 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 a pointy stick out in the street, taking out personal grievances on whoever, um, or a dictator, Napoleon. Actually, the, yeah. the the French Revolution anarchy is followed by Napoleon. Yeah, and neither one of those are very good. Anarchy or dictatorship, and right. so the the middle way is this. Uh, idea of government by the consent of the governed based on a social contract and we're working together for the common good. But again, the, the, the underlying idea there is social contract and it only works if people consent to it. So that's one idea. We're looking at uh, secular governments, but um, it sort of invites a reflection on, as you said, we are living in this post-Easter world and we begin to pick up scriptures like we've been looking at in uh, First Peter, where he talks about, you know, we're uh, sort of alien and strangers in this world, but our citizenship is, is in another place. We're citizens of another government. And so Easter invites a reflection on this other kind of government. And what is that, well, you Well, you know, for me, even more basically, Easter should invite us into a reflection on what is God trying to do. Again, I think so much of church life is lived on Good Friday. And so much of what we talk about is Jesus' death on our behalf and how that brings us forgiveness, how that brings us reconciliation with God, how that opens the possibility that we can escape judgment. Um, maybe escape judgment's not, not the right word, but, but that we will not be destroyed by, by judgment. Um, that's where we live, but that doesn't really begin to answer any of the questions about what God is trying to do through Easter and about what God's end goal is. Um, I think when we get stuck on Good Friday, then we might begin to form the idea that God is really interested in our future comfort and security that the reason that jesus came was so that when we die we can go to heaven and we can enjoy ourselves and we can have this sort of
personalized experience that is pleasant um, in afterlife as a reward, uh, which is strange because we do say that it's purely by grace and we don't deserve it, but we still think about it as a reward. Is that what God is up to or is there something else? So it's almost like we get to um, uh, Good Friday and we find that the very important reality of freedom from, you know, freedom from sin, freedom from death, uh, freedom from condemnation, all these things. But we, we stop short of the, okay, so what, is, what are you are free to do? I mean, right. it's, the, it's the other side of freedom. So we know we're free from something, but we don't have any idea what we're free to do after that what that shape of freedom takes. And I think that's a, that is an incredibly important discussion. What are we free to? I mean, that's, you know, right. essential. Well, and again, it has, it raises questions about what is God doing? What is God up to? What is God's mind? And I think the short answer that we find through a long trajectory in scripture is that God is interested in establishing a government. That is God's mm -hmm. end goal. Um, and uh, we can go all the way back to Genesis, and uh, we do have the reality of human disobedience and the fall. Um, and then the rest of the Bible is a story. How is God going to fix it? We know that God's mind, God's heart, is to reclaim what has been lost. But the scriptures present us not just with this idea. They present us with all the logistics. How is God going to accomplish this thing? So uh, on Sunday, we took... Uh, a trip back in, in scriptural time in the story and we read about some promises that God made with Abraham. Mm -hmm. I am going to bless the nations of the earth, bless the people of the earth through your family. This is it's going to be a cooperative effort, my, my reclamation of what's broken. That takes another step forward in Exodus when God makes a very specific um, agreement with the children of Israel who become a, a great nation, they're going to be this nation of priests. That's the work that, that God's calling us into even now. Um, but the work even gets more specific than that. When we turn to the story of Samuel, the people of Israel have been living as a loose confederation. And they've been guided by people who are called judges. That's what the book of Judges is about. Judges, right. 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 That makes sense. Right. And... Um, but that system falls apart at the end of Samuel's life. And the people come before Samuel and they say, we want a king. We don't want your sons. They're lousy and you're old. So give us a king. And this breaks Samuel's heart and Samuel takes it to God. And we have this incredible conversation that is recorded between God and Samuel. Right, right. And what, is, what does God say? Yeah, basically, I think, you know, we're finding that God is going to provide a king for his people uh, and, and one that will deliver them. So the people are asking for a king and Samuel is heartbroken. They, he, he wants, you know, just God to be sort of, I guess, a theocracy, but, but God says, no, you know, the people do need a king. And so he gives them David. Well, and more immediately, God says, Samuel, well, so. yeah, God says, Samuel, they haven't rejected you. They rejected me. Mm. I'm supposed to be their king. And their rejection of your leadership is a rejection of my leadership. Warn the people what it'll be like to have a king, but go ahead and give it to them. And they are blessed with Saul. But it doesn't take even two generations for God to redeem that. God takes the rejection of his leadership, and God gives them David. And then to David, God makes a promise. That one day, David, one of your descendants will be the ideal king, will rule in my place perfectly. And this is the idea of Messiah, or the idea of Christ, the anointed chosen one. And I love it because um, there's this idea that uh, we have a hard time with stuff that we can't see and feel. I don't know if you've ever had trouble feeling like God loves you. I do, frequently, because... God can't hug us. Um, you can't talk to God and have God talk back. We're given promises, but they're ideas. And we have to work hard to let those ideas influence the way that we feel. One of my favorite Johnny Cash songs is Flesh and Blood Needs Flesh and Blood. It's true. <laughs> and God knows that. Yeah. And God is not offended by that. 
God says, if that's what you need, that's what you'll get. God promises the king. And um, not only has God promised the king, but God promises a government. And is a government under which all creation will flourish. And reconciliation will begin. And this is born out through the prophets. The idea grows and grows and grows. And um, when Jesus finally arrives, we talk about this all the time at Christmas. Jesus is the one. It is his government that's being instituted. And, and Easter is the... Um, it's, it's, it's kind of like the, the, the installation, mm -hmm. the, I don't want to say coronation, that'll be at the end, but. but Certainly the vindication. The vindication, and, and as we read several weeks ago in the service in Philippians, because of what Jesus did, he is now uh, glorified and exalted and sits at the right hand of the Father. And every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord is actually means master, that he is master. Yeah, it, it, uh, yeah the Lord is the, the Greek, I think, uh, when, when the gospel goes into the Greek territories, Lord fits, they're used to Caesar. And in the more Hebrew scriptures, you just find this, the Christ, the anointed, um, the Messiah, Messiah King. So whether it's in Greek or it's in uh, uh, the more Hebrew understanding, Jesus is this incredible royal figure yeah. so for me what is god doing on easter well it's much bigger than than heaven or what happens after we die it's much bigger than forgiveness god is continuing this movement of establishing his government on earth again if we have questions about this we can go back the legitimacy of my claim we can go back to the old testament um isaiah chapter 11 we always read from... It's a great text for every season. It is such a great text. But we often read it at, at Christmas yeah. time. But here again the words. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots a branch will bear fruit. Uh, that descendant of David. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding. The spirit of counsel and might. The spirit of the knowledge and fear of the Lord. He will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears. But with righteousness, he will judge the needy. And with justice, he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. With the breath of his lips, he will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt. Faithfulness, the sash around his waist. And in that day, the root of Jesse will stand as a banner for all the people the nations will rally to him, and his resting place will be glorious. It's a government. Mm. And it becomes even more explicit when we turn back for a moment to Isaiah chapter 2. Um, well, I'm in the wrong place. Nine. Chapter 9. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Chapter 9. Um, where uh, we are reminded about this uh, Messiah, and you have the wonderful thing, the government will be upon his shoulders. Yeah. Um, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Mighty Counselor, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And, uh, and that's what it says. For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government, in peace there will be no end and he will reign on david's throne and over his kingdom establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from this time on and forever and the zeal of the lord almighty will accomplish this quite a statement of government it is and again it's about government it's not about heaven it's not about uh, spirits it's not about souls it's about a government that does stuff and that does good stuff and so this idea, you know, Jesus spoke much about in his ministry, the kingdom of God. And I mean, that was his sermon. Every sermon, I think, or every, almost every parable has something to do with the kingdom of God. It's this government idea. And on Easter, we see the, the beachhead of that government established here yeah. on earth. And it is a, a, a government on earth involving people and yeah. in the king, Jesus. Yeah. So, um... For me, that's just an incredibly important way to begin to think about Easter. In this season that we're in now, uh, 
Easter tide, and also this waiting for Jesus to return. What are we supposed to be doing? Um, so we talked about two ideas. We talked about theories of government and the reality of this um, social contract, and, and then also this reality that God is establishing a government. That's the point. So what does that leave us with now? It leaves, put the ideas together. It, it seems like it, that to me, it's leaving us with um, a stake in the game. It's leaving us with God participate, asking us to participate with God in the establishment of this kingdom. Right. On earth, now as it is, it will be in heaven one day. Right. You know, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So, so we're about kingdom business, government building, uh, for the kingdom of God here now, I think. Well, and for me too, it's about becoming a citizen. It's about consenting to yeah. Jesus' rule. So, you know, we have these hard things. We talked about some hard things on Sunday mornings um, recently uh, about submission to authority in order to avoid charges of hypocrisy and in order to build up those who are around us. We've talked about... Um, learning to suffer persecution without retaliating uh, because when we do it in the name of Jesus, it can be salvific. We also have these ideas of holiness that you talked about four weeks ago, mm -hmm. be holy. That's always a hard pitch. Why should you be holy? Especially when the idea is like, if you act good enough now, then you get to go to heaven. But if you don't act good enough now, then you don't get to go to heaven. To me, those are really hard sales pitches they're not very convincing to me uh, they operate on guilt and uh, guilt is a lousy motivator it's easier to do something that you know is wrong and just feel guilty about it than it is to <laughs> change what you're doing <laughs> right but this totally changes the idea like what is this life all about why should we do any of this stuff and and it puts in a new level if you are interested in becoming a citizen of Jesus's government, um, then it influences the way that we live. Yeah. And it is purely on us. It is our consent. Governments only exist by consent. Yeah, I mean, that is the wonder. I mean, I think, you know, um, Jesus could have come back after the resurrection, uh, appeared to Pontius Pilate and said, get on your knees. He could have come to uh, Herod and, and uh, punished him for his role in the crucifixion. But instead, Jesus chose to come back to certain followers and invite them into the kingdom. It's always a kingdom invitation. It's, it's remarkable to me that God doesn't slay us with his sovereignty, but rather chooses to, to give us this consent of the governed sort yeah. of thing. Yeah, so it begins to answer for me questions about what am I doing now? And, and the idea is, understanding his government how does it work what is entailed if i'm going to be a good citizen what does that look like and if i'm really interested in his vision of government um then it, it's on me um with the help of the holy spirit um to begin to understand that and form myself into it it also helps me think about um issues of time and waiting I had a wonderful time uh, with Callan Grove last year going through the book of Revelation together. And one of the themes is this idea of waiting and why is God waiting? And another one of the themes is the army of witnesses, uh, people who have been faithful even to death who surround Jesus. And I think one of the answers is that Jesus is was waiting for as many people who want to say, I want to be one of your citizens waiting for as many people um, as possible to, to make that step. Because um, again, Jesus is not going to force it. He's not going to twist anybody's arm. His government will exist. He will have citizens because they have chosen to be there. Um, and so again, as frustrated as I get, why won't Jesus just come back? Why won't Jesus just fix what's wrong? This idea will Jesus is not going to twist anybody's arm. He's not a dictator. Yeah. Please. Mean dictatorships don't work. They don't. And, and he's, you know, when I see these wrongs, when I get impatient, Jesus, why don't you fix this? I often feel the tug on my own sleeve that 
Jesus is saying, I've, I've shown this to you. Now you be part of, of the solution. You know, you be part of releasing the rule and reign of God on earth, releasing the kingdom of God. And I think that's what we do in proclamation. It's what we do in deed. We declare that Jesus is Lord in this situation. And whatever the situation might be, it can be personal, it can be uh, communal, but whatever the situation is, we release the reign and rule of God in that place. Yeah, and again, just going back briefly to Easter and you know, to wrongs committed and my impatience, death is really the, the problem. Uh, death is the issue. It, it's, it's the, um, it's the thing that makes everything urgent. Um, and it is strange to be invited into a government where death is no longer the hang-up. Yeah. Where it sort of takes the sting out of dictators in this world who want to say, you know, uh, we'll kill you if you don't do what we say. And uh, The Christians throughout uh, the 20 centuries of witness are saying, well, you, you really can't take away my life. My life is hidden with God, so that's not a viable threat anymore. Well, it's not, and by the same token, when it comes to the the worst things that human beings do to each other that are unspeakable, and I get impatient and I say, you know, Jesus, why have you not acted? I think Jesus' answer is, death is not an issue. I'll fix it. It will be fixed. It will be taken care of. Are you going to be a, a, a good citizen or not? That is your concern. The bad stuff is my concern. Death is not an issue. I'll take care of it. Your concern is just living out your duties as a, as a citizen. Are you willing to keep doing it or not? Nathaniel, thank you so much for this sort of uh, pointing us towards some great points of reflection and moving into action, we think of our own government and the necessity for us to be good citizens in American government. I mean, that's what Peter is talking to uh, the early Christians about, be good citizens in your government. And as you're good citizens in your government, make sure you're good citizens uh, in, in, in Christ rule and reign in the kingdom of God and in this new thing that uh, he is doing that will uh, move through death uh, into um, the world to come. So th these are great reflections. Um, as we close our time together this evening, um, let's use this as a springboard for prayer. Um, first of all, Thanksgiving, I think, for our nation was as flawed as it may seem to many people today. It is this great continuing experiment that demands our um, positive and helpful involvement uh, in this experiment. How can we uh, together work uh, to keep our, our nation free? But also a great uh, time to pray not only for our nation, but for God's will to be done on earth and to reflect on our role in, in Christ's government that was established solidly uh, on Easter and that will extend into his coming again. So these are great themes to think about. Well, um, I'll close this in prayer, and uh, we look forward to, again, uh, being with you next Wednesday. Let's pray together. Father, there is uh, so much for which we need to pray as we reflect on our nation. Our, my immediate response is to uh, look at all the wrongs and ask that they be righted. And Lord, certainly, uh, we ask that the wrongs be righted and that uh, sanity might return to our nation. But Lord, we also give thanks for our nation and the possibilities that you have given us uh, to participate and to have a say in the future of what will happen to our society. Lord, we thank you for uh, the greater kingdom that informs all the kingdoms of these worlds. Uh, we thank you for the kingdom of God. And Lord, we pray that you would give us wisdom to be good citizens in your kingdom and to live under your government and your rule and Lord, we give you thanks that the government is not on our shoulders, but Lord, it is on yours and you are pushing it toward your uh, wonderful and just and righteous fulfillment. So watch over us and uh, help us be good citizens in all worlds. We pray in Christ's name.
Mm -hmm. So thank you again, and God bless you. Good night.